Welcome to a brand new Connecting the Dots. I'm Carla Santos, and today's episode will dive into decolonizing philanthropy, a movement that is changing how non-Indigenous donors support Indigenous-led organizations in promoting the creation and expansion of networks for Indigenous-led funds. To decolonize philanthropy, we must dismantle the colonialism embedded in the funding mechanisms of Western organizations when working with Indigenous partners. True allyship begins with actively listening to the communities we serve. Joining international funders for Indigenous peoples has been critical in Azimut's learning journey and helped us answer a crucial question. How can Indigenous peoples access funds and resources without once again being subjected to the violence of colonialism? Our guest today, Naomi Lenoy Leleto, a Maasai from Narok, Kenya, is at the forefront of the movement to decolonize philanthropy. She is a board member at the International Funders for Indigenous Peoples, Program Coordinator for Global Indigenous Grant Making, and Coordinator for the East Africa Advisory Board for the Global Green Grants Fund. Naomi worked as a Women Land Rights Program Officer at the Kenyan Land Alliance, advocating for the effective implementation of constitutional provisions to secure women's land rights. She has extensive experience advocating for inclusive grant making that upholds the rights, self-determination and environmental work of indigenous peoples. Naomi has a master's degree in legal studies from the Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy Program at the University of Arizona. She has contributed to the UN's Permanent Forum for Indigenous Issues since 2011. Naomi, thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Maybe we could start with uh, with our interconnected stories. Your journey of activism and alliance with indigenous communities in Kenya, championing land rights and environmental stewardship has been inspiring to us. We have partnered with two Andorais led organizations. The Andorais are a, a community that has faced displacement twice, first due to a tourism project and more recently due to the rising waters of Lake Bogoria, where they relocated. Their story is one among many, and I think you can help us understand the broader impact of climate change on communities in Kenya. Can you tell us a little about your story and maybe elaborate on how climate change contributes to the ongoing struggle for land rights? Thank you so much, Akala. Um, let me start by saying that um, I appreciate your work in decolonizing philanthropy. Um, at GGF, actually, uh, uh, within the Indigenous Peoples Program, uh, within uh, which I operate in, uh, we have a similar approach. And this is an approach we call indigenizing philanthropy. And um, this means, uh, of course, rethinking traditional philanthropic models uh, to, of course, um, better serve the unique needs and aspirations of Indigenous peoples. And that is based on the, the five principles, of course, as detailed by IFIP, that is uh, International Funders for Indigenous Peoples, of uh, respect, reciprocity, uh, responsibility, uh, and redistribution. Very recently, we added another R, which is the redistribution. And um, Indigenous peoples or no, no, indigenous philanthropy approaches comes with an understanding that um, community work is complex. Community work is nuanced. Community work is homegrown. Uh, with this understanding then, um, an effective effort or initiative in one indigenous community may not be effective in another, community. So to truly honor indigenous people's uh, self-determination, um, each community's effort must be supported in their own context and in their own unique way with respect to, uh, to, to their traditional governance systems. Now, uh, let me start by saying that um, in the Rift Valley, uh, the Rift Valley of Kenya, water fluctuations Though not unprecedented, uh, they now that the, the situation now pose new and uh, what I would call immediate risks to larger populations due to the rising lakes level in uh, at least about seven lakes. That is uh, Lake 
Baringo, where the Indoroes are. We have uh, Lake Bogoria, the neighboring lake that is almost merging up with uh, Lake Baringo. We have Lake Trukana in the north. We have Nakuru, uh, Lake Nakuru. We have Lake Elementaita. Um, we have Lake Magadi and I think Lake Logipi. Lo 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 and this, of course, as you clearly posit, has led to displacement of indigenous communities, notably the Endoroes in Lake Baringo, and, um, and, um, and one other community that I would perhaps want to share more about, because I know you've already interacted with, uh, with, with the Endoroes, and that's the El, El Molo, El Molo indigenous communities in Lake Trukana. And just to share a little bit about the El Molo, uh, the El Molo are indigenous, they are fisher folk community in Lake Trukana, who are actually in the face of extinction. And that's why I, I perhaps wanted to give or share more about them. Um, they are they're in the face of extinction and are struggling against assimilation by majority uh, tribes, as well as um, struggles around their land rights uh, due to encroachment by the majority communities. And um, the worst of it all, and perhaps this is where I would want to give a little bit of depth, is how they have negatively been affected by the Lake Trukana power plant project. And this is the largest Africa's wind energy plant. They actually disregarded the impact of the project uh, on the El Molo community and also disregarded other indigenous communities uh, like the Samburu, the Trukana, the Rendile, uh, these are the neighboring communities. And what they said, uh, who have been affected by the project, uh, they said that these communities are non-indigenous, you see? And this is a decision that contradicts what I would call the African uh, Commission on Human Rights, uh, on Peoples and Human Rights, recognition of this community. The, the, uh, as indigenous, they've already been doc uh, re uh, recognized, they've been documented as so. So this, has, this was very unfortunate. So in essence, um, while renewable energy is crucial for mitigating global warming, the implementation of such projects and many other projects across the globe uh, can disregard what I would call the social responsibility, you know, as a social fabric towards local communities. And the installation of the, 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 the wind turbines um, in, 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 in the indigenous people's territory, you are talking of more than 300 wind, wind turbines. Uh, by this particular uh, um, company has uh, affect, uh, adversely affected um, uh, indigenous communities by occupying their lands without proper uh, ethnic free prayer informed consultation. And what that has done, it has violated their rights. And in essence, the land rights uh, for indigenous communities have indeed been a contentious and complex issue in many parts of the world. Um, and, and you realize that indigenous peoples have often, they have a deep historical and cultural uh, connection. Uh, so in, in the intersection of land rights for indigenous communities and climate change, adds another layer of complexity to a already challenging um, issue. And maybe to close on that question, there are four aspects. There is an aspect of ownership. There is an aspect of control. There is an aspect of use. And um, there is an aspect of access. Without these four aspects, then, or if any of these four aspects is, is, is missing, then totally, um, you have violated indigenous people's uh, rights. So that is a bit that I wanted to add and um, really uh, look at the situation of the rising waters, look at the situation of, of, of climate change and just perhaps the, the depth at which indigenous people's struggles um, uh, are in grind. So it's, it's quite an unfortunate situation, uh, Callum. Science increasingly recognizes indigenous knowledge as a powerful tool for preserving biodiversity and fighting climate change. We've seen increased global visibility of indigenous rights violations, more recently with the violent images of the Maasai evictions from Loliondo and of the Ogiek from the Mal Forest. 
Is this increased recognition translating to meaningful change in greater participation of Indigenous peoples in decision making? The acknowledgement of traditional knowledge, uh, of course, is affirmed as a positive step, especially when Indigenous uh, communities seek justice in court or discussion points in meetings and conferences. Um, however, in practice, the implementation of this recognition is lacking. An example of this disparity is, uh, evident, is evident in the case of the Ogiek, uh, in Kenya, and of course, the Maasai uh, in Loliondo, Tanzania, as you clearly put it. Now, let me give just a brief overview of, of the Maasai in Loliondo, because this is an area where GGF uh, has really put in a lot of effort, and we've really stood in solidarity with this community, even with the Ogie community. With the, uh, with the Loliondo injustices, um, the Maasai and their livestock continue to face what I would call forceful eviction. And this is way back, uh, not only when the current eviction started in June 22, but way, way, way back. And this is to, to make way for exclusive tourism hunting for the UAE royals, you know. And this actually started with the, with the conversion. What happened is it started with the conversion of land ownership from village land uh, to game reserves. And this occurred without uh, consulting the pastoralist people in Loliondo. And it's funny because the government justifies this conversion uh, by promoting what I would call conservation as a primary reason for land grabbing. And conservation has been such a, has been the question um, that uh, is, is, is really affecting a lot of indigenous communities. And I think their aim is to appeal to the global community interest in wildlife conservation. However, you realize that for the past 30 uh, years, conservation has not been an issue. You know, it's never been an issue to the Maasai. And the Maasai community could not go down without a fight, really. You know, they resisted the eviction through justice systems. And many of them, they still have court cases and many of them have lost their lives. And here is why they did that. One, um, the grabbed land is a vi is, is vital for their pastoral livelihoods. Number two, uh, the decision lacked uh, ethnic principles. And then number three, the process was unlawful and violent and cruel. And then lastly, there was no new, there was no um, due diligence in conducting um, there was no, I mean, the, no due diligence was, was conducted to assess the consequences of taking the land. So unfortunately, despite the potential for mutually benefit uh, dialogue between the community and the government, the eviction was marked by false corruption, discrimination. And I say it was unfortunate. Uh, I've experienced uh, and really worked very closely with the communities. And uh, I think I'm still traumatized by what I've seen, what I continue, what I saw, what I heard. It was, it was not, um, it was not necessary to use such force. And um, now coming to the Ogiek, the eviction from Sasimwani in Mao is both also unjust and unwarranted, especially considering that the Kenyan government has not yet even implemented. Uh, the landmark 2017 court case that recognized the Ogig rights to their ancestral land. And this was followed by yet another judgment by, us, the, by the African court in 2022, which was prompted by the government's failure to implement um, the 2017 decision, you see? Now, this highlights the ongoing plight of the Ogi, who continue to face evictions from their ancestral lands. Adding complexities to the situation behind some of these eviction is the involvement of carbon markets, you know, where the Kenyan government appears to be solidifying uh, its territorial uh, and financial control over the valuable assets of indigenous people's natural resources. Uh, the Mao forest being Kenya's largest forest <laughs> is actually attracting interest uh, from offsetting uh, companies and potentially influencing the government's action. And this being the reason why indigenous peoples like the Ogiek find themselves 
at the forefront of questionable climate solutions. And these solutions are being used to justify evictions and emissions. For example, uh, in October, Blue Carbon announced, uh, that is October last year, they announced a significant agreement with Kenyan's uh, government and the state of department, uh, the state of environment and climate change, uh, aiming of course to generate carbon credits uh, for a vast project area. And this totally unfortunate, the least that these communities can, uh, the government can do is to at least have a discussion with these communities. You know, these are communities who possess knowledge to conserve and the approaches within which these carbon markets are um, are being uh, brought to the communities. There is a lot of transparency issues. There is land grabbing. Uh, there is no consultation approaches. There, is, there are a lot of gaps. There are a lot of gaps. And again, there are a lot of questions. And what is the logic? You know, what is the logic of all this? To allow polluters to pay forest owners to absorb their emissions through the carbon absorption capacity of trees. And this development suggests a shift in perception of carbon. Traditionally, and looking at it from a very layman's perspective, uh, when I was growing up, I was told um, carbon is poisonous and carbon is black. <laughs> but now it's now lucrative and I think carbon is now white. <laughs> you know, that is the irony. You know, At the center then of... Uh, just to, 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 to say that at the center of any climate solution, there must be acknowledgement that the local communities are, um, are among the most vulnerable, you know, to the impact of disasters like floods, like drought, like wildfires and climate induced natural uh, disasters. So to conclude, uh, you realize that insecure land rights land right provide little incentives or capacity to mitigate or adapt to the effects of climate change. And engagement with communities point to the fact that carbon offsets projects have been conceptualized without free prime informed consent, and they are dotted with minimal or no community involvement in development phases. So disregard, uh, disregard to existing community land governance structures uh, is a very common trend and I think um, now that has that is the language that is the language falling under conservation. That is the language falling under protected areas. That is the language that government, the gap that the African governments are speaking. Yeah. Various reports have shown that despite increased funding to fight climate change, the percentage going directly to indigenous peoples is residual. How can we change this, especially regarding the significant funding streams nations commit to in events like the COP? less than 1% of official designated assistance or, uh, for climate change and less than 5% of official assistance for general environment protection uh, is, um, is allotted to indigenous peoples. And much of the funding they do receive reinforces the same capitalistic economic policies that threaten their lives and lands. You see, for example, um, I think it, it was in 2021, five governments and 17 private funders, they pledged the 1.7 billion in Glasgow, uh, the COP in Glasgow, in support of um, indigenous and local communities land tenure. Uh, and this signaling an overdue shift in funding uh, priorities, but indigenous communities were, were, were skeptical and we still remain uh, skeptical. You know, where is the money? Uh, and is this new money or was this money paid to ongoing projects? There, there are a lot of transparency issues and there are a lot of questions that need answers. And uh, maybe to help answer this question, I would also ask, what if there was a different way of supporting communities, a way that um, philanthropy could be more meaningful than detrimental, more humble and self uh, congratulatory, you know, and that's the approach uh, that at least uh, indeed um, GG at, at Global Green Grants, you know, the approach of indigenizing philanthropy and the kind of philanthropy that engages with indigenous cultures, decision making and traditional uh, institutions or systems 
to, to, to not only transform philanthropy, but also restore balance, restore sovereignty and self-determination that of course support justice and equity for the people and nature. And I know there has been uh, several calls on philanthropy and indigenous people's organizations accountability mechanisms that will ensure funding will go directly to organizations led and governed by uh, indigenous peoples and local communities. Of course, who have a deep personal connection with um, stewardship of land and, 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 and oceans, you know? And uh, perhaps when you think about the decentralized model or what I'm calling indigenizing philanthropy at GGF, our mission is, is, is ensuring that this funding, climate funding especially, reaches grassroots uh, movements effectively and responsibly on a large scale and supporting these um, movements to make a lasting uh, impact, you know. And we are dedicated to strengthening our values, aligning our organizational structure and our aspirations for a more effective and globally integrated organization uh, and designing what I would say uh, pathways or a collaborative um, or um, ecosystem of grassroots funding uh, in our in our sector. Is there a global trend of increased funding for indigenous-led organizations, even from foundations and organizations that traditionally didn't support them? Any examples of this shift and how it leads to significant changes for indigenous-led organizations? I think to answer this question, let me borrow from IFIP statistics. They commissioned a global analysis uh, to determine the level of funding um, to indigenous peoples. I think that was between 2016 and 2019. Um, and the report points to only 0.6% of funding. And I think this is an increase from a, a previous report of 0.1% you know, in their previous uh, findings, if I'm not wrong. Now, this means, um, yeah, these figures, uh, this means there has been a growing recognition of the importance of supporting indigenous-led organizations, even from foundations and entities that um, traditionally did not prioritize indigenous causes, you know. And the positive trend is driven by maybe greater um, acknowledgement of the unique perspectives, knowledge, uh, especially related to environmental conservation and sustainable resource management. And also the rise of social movements and increased awareness of indigenous issues globally, I would say has also contributed uh, to this uh, shift. And so, and also donors and organizations are recognizing the importance of supporting initiatives that um, empower indigenous communities and address historical uh, injustices. So while these examples perhaps um, illustrate a positive trend, there are challenges. Uh, uh, the challenges and uh, disparities in funding still exist, you know, At, and, and it's essential to continue monitoring developments in, in the area of, um, in, in, in different areas uh, that advocate especially for uh, equitable support for indigenous communities. However, I think uh, we must acknowledge that indigenous peoples are coming from periods um, of intergenerational trauma. These are the gaps that we are not addressing, you know, and most of us think of, oh, it's just about money, but also you there are many ways of supporting indigenous communities, even uh, being in solidarity with their struggles and processes uh, is also another thing. So I think, and I challenge philanthropy to invest more. It's important to emphasize, prioritize funding for healing spaces, talking circles, healing exchanges. And this is one gap that is quite glaring. Very few people, very few funders are willing to invest in these uh, approaches and perspectives because most funders are interested in documentation, they're interested in reports, they're interested in documentaries. And remember, indigenous 
these are, for example, when you talk about healing spaces, talking circles, uh, ceremonies, these are sacred. And these, and these are practice, they are not documented, you know. So it becomes very difficult to, to tell uh, funders that we don't have a report. These are our sacred practices. We don't document, we practice. So this is an area that I've noticed uh, gaps in. My prayer is for funders to establish, I mean, for for operation to support uh, operations of community-led healing centers uh, because these centers can serve as safe and culturally um, sensitive spaces for various healing modalities. You know, funding um, initiatives that create safe spaces for trauma recovery, you know, and these spaces should be designed to be culturally relevant and free from judgment. That is one area that um, I really wanted uh, to, to highlight, you know, and provide resources and support for individuals dealing with trauma and uh, encourage restorative. And I actually underlined restorative, not resilience, restorative uh, building activities. The reason why I had to mention that, I'm very careful not to really say resilience because the concept of resilience can sometimes be framed within a colonial narrative that implies indigenous peoples have overcome adversity imposed upon them by external forces. And this narrative may actually negate the urgency and self-determination uh, of indigenous communities and of overemphasis of resilience actually might overshadow the ongoing struggles and hardships uh, that indigenous communities face, uh, especially on issues related to land and their territory, on issues related to environmental justice. So that's why um, resilience should be understood within the context of self-determination, in the context of cultural revitalization, and the ongoing efforts of indigenous peoples to address historical and contemporary challenges. I, I just needed to say that uh, perhaps in answering your question. Thank you, Naomi. And this, this you have touched this question already. Uh, indigenous communities uh, face challenges in getting funds because colonial grant making mechanisms still guard most of the available money. The bureaucratic requirements begin with needing organizations to be formed under specific legal frameworks and be in the loop about legal and tax requirements. There is also a philanthropic culture that prioritizes donor satisfaction and donor centricity which often can mean sacrificing their priorities for more palatable initiatives or ways of functioning. Even project framework requirements sometimes pose a hurdle because these communities traditionally and effectively solve their problems in ways that may differ from the conventional mainstream way of philanthropy. Indigenous peoples are adapting, particularly the younger generation. So the question is, how can philanthropy change these processes to better serve Indigenous communities while respecting their own ways of doing things? We believe, for example, in our grant making that uh, the best and most suitable solutions uh, to environment and other social justice come from people directly affected by these challenges. And our work is rooted uh, in the theory of change, and it is built in the power of local actors to leverage uh, systemic changes. You're thinking about indigenous peoples marching to stop oil development in the Amazon to, 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 to teams of citizens organizing to monitor industrial water and many, many more examples. To even uh, the youth voicing um, around various climate just injustices. Now we see the youth becoming very active. And on, on all the stories we've shared, right from the Ogie to, to, to the Maasai in Loliondo, and, uh, and, 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 and actually what I also wanted to share even as we think about that approach uh, and how GGF stood in, in solidarity with some of these communities, is even the aspect of reducing the bureaucracies within which we operate in, you know. Uh, for example, if you're helping communities who are being evicted, who are being displaced, and you want them to fill very um, detailed forms, 
Remember, some of them even don't have computers to even sit down and 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 make that possible. So even changing the mindset, changing the approaches within grant making. How do we ensure that such bureaucracies are lessened? You know, how do we receive videos, for example, as form of reporting? How do we encourage the youth to use now what is what is trending is TikTok, you know, to use technology that they are closer to. Just being flexible and making um, work and, and, and funding a little bit uh, different and if not fun. Even if we are thinking of themed grants, let us know, as I started to say, that community work is no one's and it's homegrown and it's complex. So whatever works in Latin America, let's not assume that it will work in, in Kenya. Whatever works in Asia, let us not assume that uh, it will work in uh, in Australia in, with with the, with the indigenous Aboriginal indigenous peoples. So having that understanding and appreciating uh, um, that, I think that's that's very important. Um, just being very flexible and uh, being very innovative, but most importantly. Uh, operating from a point of humility, because when you operate from a point of humility, it makes it easier to understand where communities are coming from and the struggles that they are going through. Thank you. <laughs> we have had a great experience supporting small grassroots organizations. Global Green Grants has been doing meaningful work in this area for many years. Would you share an anecdote or observation that reflects the significance of directly funding Indigenous-led initiatives? When you talk about uh, small grants, uh, when you talk of working directly uh, with communities, uh, we, I think that is our area that, uh, and that's our identity. One of the things that we've really done, especially within our decentralized model, is understanding that um, Communities are coming from geographies, sometimes very difficult geographies. We need to at least recognize that when we make calls for proposals, not all of them will have access to these calls. Communities, for example, who are not structured, but are doing amazing work, you know, communities who don't have a computer on their desktop, I mean, who don't have a, compu a computer on their desk, and they don't even know that funding exists. But as GGF, what we do, we try to reach these communities through our advisors who are localized, who are expert with um, and are staying within communities who can at least access uh, some of these um, initiatives done uh, by communities. In that sense, then, we are reaching out to communities and supporting communities who've been left out uh, within the funding landscape for for many many years, and that is that is that is where we go to. When you talk about grassroots, and when I hear people talking about, about grassroots, I tend to ask, what is what what is grassroots? What does it? How do you understand that term? You know, because for many years, uh, funding has been captured. You know, captured by organizations that can speak English captured by organizations that can access calls for funding and captured by organizations that feel superior and are just out there to receive money. But when you go to the grassroots, the reality is that this money is not getting to the, to, to the grassroots because the people who are most vulnerable, the people who are most impacted are not receiving this money. So, the beauty of working with communities, the beauty of having a relationship with communities, uh, the beauty of trusting that they will do whatever they will do with the money that you've given them, because the other issue also is about trust. You know, you have a million of evaluations. <laughs> you you know you spent you see funders spending so much money traveling to visit communities for evaluation purposes. That money could have gone into useful ways, you know? You, you, you spent almost 10,000 to come and evaluate a project of $3,000. I think it's a high time we have a sit down and really ask questions about the approaches to funding 
is it is it is it are we serious uh, and are we are we intentional in what you're doing in what we are doing what advancements have you witnessed in the movement to decolonize philanthropy what frustrations persist and what hurdles are particularly challenging i, I like uh, and, and decolonize is good and i, I normally use indigenous in philanthropy is to critically dive into the importance of indigenous cultures and cosmovision. Now, when you think of decolonizing philanthropy, dive into decision-making uh, and indigenous uh, and really work closely and think of supporting traditional governance systems as a way to on, not only transform uh, philanthropy, but also uh, restore balance and sovereignty that support uh, justice and equity for people and nature. And you realize that indigenous traditional leadership, which has been long overlooked, yet necessary, is critical in, in achieving this transformation. And I've seen a shift of strength and grant making that take root in the models of traditional governance of indigenous peoples, while, also, while of course focusing on traditional association and decision making. But there are many challenges, as, as you put, and especially around uh, funders operating on assumptions. We really need to examine our assumptions in grant making, you know, and what this will do, it will improve the chances of collaboration with, especially with indigenous peoples. Uh, and we need to recognize that um, communities, just like any other, they have diverse views. They have di uh, diverse demands and we cannot assume a unified uh, position. Let us also not assume that indigenous people's needs are our needs. So you visit communities and perhaps you notice uh, um, women are walking long distances to fetch firewood. So what should I do? I should support these people with a solar panel. That is your own assumption. Who told you they need that? You know, funders really... Uh, spend time in cultivating and sustaining relationship. And this requires trust. As I say, it requires humility. You know, it requires collaboration and mission alignment and, and, and respect for this community. So what I see is a lot of power dynamics that exist. Uh, and, and, and we need to actually demystify some of these approaches because you also notice, as I said before, less FPIC, uh, and not really involving communities in our ideation. You're just coming to implement. You've not been, you've not been with them when you're starting or thinking around a certain initiative, but you want to implement it to the to, to them. How does that work? You know, they were not part of, 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 of the system. They did not did not contribute. They did not even have. They don't even have an idea. But you bring the, bring that to them because you are coming uh, as a savior to their to their struggles. That that will not work. Your experience as a lawyer and activist has given you a unique perspective on the political fight for the rights of indigenous peoples. You have worked on international policy and resolutions through forums like the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues while also having a hands-on approach through your work advocating for women's land rights in Kenya. We would like to know more about how these two approaches complement each other when it comes to advancing the rights of indigenous peoples. Let me say by, um, start by saying that my um, experience um, has been very instrumental uh, in a lot of my operations. And I say this with a lot of humility. I worked with grassroots women uh, I worked with grassroots organizations and even at the national level uh, before I transitioned to philanthropy. And I was a little bit skeptical actually joining philanthropy because of the experiences that I faced. And when I came into this space of philanthropy, I realized that I'm operating at a point of privilege and what that means is for me to really ensure that my work and my approaches is all based on humility because you are coming from, you're transitioning from 
the end of receiving, you're not going to the end of giving. And for, for me to really do this work, I have to do it with a lot of humility and understand and appreciate a lot of, a lot of dynamics. And I'll give a story that um, made me question philanthropy uh, even a long time, even before thinking that I'll ever join um, uh, this part of, 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 of giving. And this is a story where I was, um, I was uh, overseeing a certain project uh, and we got support when I was working with the grassroots initiative uh, for, 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 for communities um, to, to, to drill a well. And so, and that's why I'm also skeptical in evaluation. So the well was done and communities were happy. And remember the well was a little bit further. And when the well was commissioned, communities had rules and regulations around how the how 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 um they are going to, to operate, you know. In the morning, we meant to go fetch water. Uh, that is between maybe uh from 8 a.m. to around 11. Then from 11, you have the animals coming in to drink water. The part of the uh, area that I'm talking about is very hot and very dry, you know. This is very systematic and uh, there's a reason for that because if the animals come first, the, the, the well would be dirty. So this funder comes in and says, she wants to meet the women at 8 a.m. And, and the rules, the women had to follow the rules very religiously because water is very scarce in that part of the world. And um, there's a traditional system uh, that governs, that set rules. So this particular funder said she needed to, to meet with, with, with the women because they don't even have, uh, they, they cannot have a separate, a, 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 a similar sitting uh, women and men don't uh, will always have different sittings. So, said I want to meet the women first, and then the men, uh, and then uh, because I have I'm time bad, I need to to leave. Uh, I need to have an, other errands to run. So I found that quite illogical because she did not even want to know how communities operate. I tried to tell her the women are not available in the morning. Perhaps we can do this meeting in the afternoon. And according to her, it's very hot in that part of the world. And I don't think I can stand the heat around that time, you know. So it's either I meet these communities in the morning because that's the only time uh, I have. And then I proceed to my other activities. And I say this, I share this story, uh, and I always remember um, how uh, insensitive uh, funders can be. So I, what I did actually, I did not even uh, communicate to, <laughs> to the organizers uh, or people who are helping mobilize communities. I did not want to change that uh approach within it they were operating so after writing and communicating to her she couldn't understand I said okay uh, I think uh, for the first time uh, we just let's see how this goes and she comes in and no one's because we could meet under trees nobody showed up until uh, 1 p.m all this time she's ranting she's and remember she cannot leave because she needs to take photos she, she needs to 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 take videos and all that and when the communities came uh, she was mad she was insensitive but I was privileged to do the translation and I made sure I translated the right. So she wondered why she's speaking with a lot of bitterness, yet the communities are smiling. And so um, anyway, that is a story for another day. But what I'm trying to say is um, now being on this other side, uh, I have to ensure that uh, we operate to build relationship, we operate to build trust, we have less assumption, I have less assumptions in my work. And um, I respect and um, really approach communities from their point and not really from my point. So that, that I, I, yeah, maybe that's how I would answer that question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naomi, for helping us understand how to build a more effective and equitable philanthropic system. And thank you to all who listen to Connecting the Dots. 
If you found this episode interesting, explore the other episodes or read the full interviews at azimuthworldfoundation.org slash insights. Thank you. Thank you.